predicament. So now I'm trying to recruit PP to fight on our behalf so we can just have more bodies. <laughs> they, got nothing, the link. they got nothing else to do. <laughs> yeah, it's just like, <laughs> they're like, why is there like 70? <laughs> like, 70. <laughs> <laughs> they're all like, Thanks for sending them the group me. I think like people have been always afraid to speak up. And I'm like, if you want change, they have to say it. Yeah, like, it has to be a group though, because it can't just be like it can't be ten people. people. It's gotta be like twenty, thirty people. How many people have responded so far? Uh thirteen or fifteen. Yeah. Um, I feel like everybody everybody does. Everybody does. Yeah, I feel like I've been like really mad at Simon so far, but like I think if I'm saying it's been like yeah, dude, when, <laughs> when, you, when you spoke up, I was like, ooh, we in the shit. Or like, like Wayne, Wayne was like, 16 kilos, yeah. Josh told me, I was like, ooh. I would be mad at him, especially mad at him. Yeah. I'm mad at you, I'm mad at you, I'm mad at you, I'm mad at you. 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 Yeah, I've always been confused of why it's like a uh, uh, semester by semester basis of like each game. Yeah. <laughs> if you get there around 4, 4.30, you get there. So many old people. Yeah. <laughs> They're like, oh, man, dinner time. Like, and then I went to the table, like, I can get three kilos out of here. It's been a while. Dude, this is, so mm -hmm. are you doing a week roster? Yeah. yeah. Do you, do you, how many, like, questions do you have? There's 130 more. Okay. Yeah. I did this earlier. Yeah. Is there a question yeah. there that asks about yeah. the yeah. treatment yeah. for yeah. Russian yeah. Army yeah. people? Yeah. And yeah. That's so cute. That's why they keep sending them, you know? I know. I'm really excited. Of course. Wasn't Rocky Potter, yeah. Rocky yeah. Potter, yeah. Rocky Potter, yeah. Rocky Potter, yeah. Rocky Potter, yeah. Rocky yeah. no matter what, yeah. they have to be. Yeah. yeah. So that's why I was looking for the yeah. yeah. Because I was like, yeah. 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 But like, yeah. Yeah. this just like, yeah. 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 Yeah, I remember, like, I really remember that from Dr. Walsh Fletcher. Yeah. Josh, you know, matter what, didn't talk about Like, I just looked at you, I thought, like, come on. 
I teach anatomy, so that's why I'm a believer, and I teach first-year students and fourth-year students, and it's 
first year students are always asking me, why are we so about sexting? Fourth year students is for you know, surgery. Mm -hmm. You mean I only have one more month? Wait. But the top part of what I'm hearing is you all are positioning. so valuable to well, and the, you know, that's something else the, the argument is, is that there, if you look at some of the studies, there's some of the studies that say that doing these other methods, like the, the virtual, the 3D, and, and some of the other methods that have been statistically just as effective. But, uh, you know, and, okay, that's fine when you learn, but when it comes down to the point where you're going to be picking your nose on somebody, it's, it's just, it's not the same. I see you. You do the most. Every I I'll say what I got you at that same time. I'm not going to tell you. <laughs> but I think I have a long way to go. <laughs> but it was like a lot of like feeling like third, fourth order questions. Yeah. It was like not a lot of like, what's the diagnosis or what's the treatment. It was like, which is kind of cool. I feel like that's what we tend to get on. We tend to get a lot more of that. It was like the competition of the medication of the treatment and things that they didn't tell you what it was. You really got to work your way there. Yeah. But, <laughs> <laughs> I don't think it covers it. Like there was a lot of brain insects all day on it. And it didn't cover us all. A couple of things from pharmacy. Like there were no relationships. Yeah. Like that alone just makes sense. Yeah. What did you think? Yeah, there was a small number of like general pharmacy questions. Yeah. There was a, a I think I have a bigger question. I know you have a bigger question. Yeah. I have not heard it before. Okay. That was, that was all. Yeah. 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 If you don't have all the questions on exam, if every question is on exam, I should get 100%. Yeah. <laughs> Apparently that's all I know is yeah. the exam time. I remember when I was studying those, I was like, it's so confusing to keep these straight. Um, that's like the only thing that I like, really, really, really well. That's not it. I, I, I somehow, I retain cardio really well. But I think it was because it was a small unit number wise. Like there was an amount of like I do better thinking about like a very complex singular condition than a whole bunch of little small conditions in one. Yeah. I feel like that's this unit though. It's like it's every unit. Yeah. So how do you feel about it having done all these things? I don't know. I don't feel really great. I didn't really study that for this. I didn't want to form a I did both of my career on the last class that I wanted to. So I was like, okay, I want to do better like on the third exam. And I feel like, and I, I like would sacrifice my practice to do better on the exam. But I don't really want to sacrifice my But I don't know if it's super awesome, but I 
Good evening. Thank you all for coming out. This is the 2022 Zadie Creel Williams Memorial Lecture. This lecture series, which takes place every two years, was endowed by Dr. Austin V. Creel and other family members as a fitting memorial to his beloved Aunt Zadie. Zadie graduated from Lynchburg College in 1924. I am happy to say that Austin's daughter, Catherine Creel Suarez, is here tonight along with her husband, Carlos. So please join me in a round of applause as a token of appreciation for their family's continued investment in the intellectual life of our university. So thank you both very much. Please take a moment to check your cell phones and make sure the ringer is off. Events of this kind are the work of many hands. Speaking on behalf of my colleagues in the Department of Religious Studies, Drs. Bosco Bay, Amy Merle Willis, 
I would like to thank Nicole Smith and her colleagues in the Office of University Communications and Marketing. They created the poster announcing the lecture, the program that you picked up as you entered the hall, and they publicized the event far and wide. I also wish to thank Louis Donato, who made the arrangements for this event to be live streamed. And I welcome everyone who is watching from far away. For their support of this lecture series, as well as the ongoing work of the Religious Studies Department, I wish to thank Dean Cheryl Coleman, Provost Allison Jablonski, and President Allison morrison Sierra. Sadie Creel Williams, as I, as I have mentioned, graduated from Lincolnshire College in 1924. Sadie was by vocation an educator. For many years, she taught in public schools. She taught all ages and eventually moved into administration. She was also involved in an array of activities outside of the classroom, anything from directing theatrical productions to coaching basketball. Like many of us who teach, Zadie was at heart, as we might say today, a lifelong learner. Austin Creel, like his beloved pup, and that was his childhood nickname for Zadie, was himself a teacher and a lifelong learner. Austin was among the first generation of religious uh, study scholars in the United States to focus his research and writing on the religious traditions of India. He wrote his dissertation on Hindu ethics and enjoyed a productive and distinguished career as professor of religion at the University of Florida. Among his many accomplishments, Austin founded the Asian Studies Program at the University of Florida and served as chair of the Religious Studies Department for many years. Besides memorializing Pup, part of Austin's motive for endowing the Zadie Creel Williams Memorial Lectureship was to promote the humanistic study of religion. Religion is a notoriously difficult concept to theorize for our purposes tonight, allow me to suggest the following. Religion points to the narrative that people have told and continue to tell in order to explain and understand themselves, both in relation to others and to the natural and human world surrounding them. These narratives, stories, might be a less academically word, are by turns fantastic, exhilarating, comforting and heartbreaking. Stories are in fact pra practices. They are events in which we participate as tellers and listeners. Stories affect us. They can send a shiver down our spines or strangely warm our hearts. Stories are carriers of the Delphic imperative, know thyself. They are humanistic therapies that aim to transform and heal the human in body, mind, and soul. The healing power of storytelling brings us to tonight's lecturer, Dr. Raymond Barfield. I encourage you to read the fine biography printed on the program. Dr. Barfield has carved out a place for himself at the intersection of medicine and the humanities. He has long been interested in the experience of suffering and the power of imagination working through stories in response to suffering. What can we learn about ourselves and our world through examination of the symbiosis existing between suffering and stories? Dr. Barfield has pursued this question through four volumes of philosophy, three collections of poetry, and a novel. His pursuit is not only creative and theoretical, but practical as well. He is a practicing physician who currently works in private practice as the medical director of palliative care. He is, in short, an engaged practitioner of the humanities. Join me in welcoming the 2022 Zadie Creel Williams Memorial Lecturer, Dr. Raymond Barfield. Tell you, I uh, 
For the past two years, um, I've been directing this palliative care program at a hospital that serves rural Georgia. And um, I've, you know, no one has seen the lower half of my face for two years, so it's the first time <laughs> anyone has seen it, so congratulations before I apologize. I don't know what you're to say. But it's been quite something to be, um, to be in that isolated situation. And the other thing about it is that uh, I used to give talks a lot and I forgot how to do it. <laughs> um, and so uh, this is the first talk that I've given publicly in two years. And, um, and I'm really glad to be here to, to do it. But let's see, let's see how this goes. Um, so let me start with something you've probably heard before about the difference between facts and um, a story. So I can't even remember, y'all probably know who, who said this, I can't remember who said this, but I love it. Um, whoever said this thing uh, said, here's some facts. The king died and then the queen died. Here's a story. The king died and then the queen died of a broken heart. And there's something in that second version that overwhelms in a very profound way. All you need to know is that the king died and then the queen died of a broken heart. And you now know something about the queen that is um, simply not fittable into uh, a series of, of facts. You feel for her. Uh, you have a different experience of her. And so, um, you know, when, when, who here is in, planning on going into medicine? I'm always interested in physical therapy, uh, physician assistant, nursing. Who here is planning on ever going to a doctor or a PA? Who here is going to get sick? Is there anyone here who's going to die someday? <laughs> okay, good. So everybody, we're all in the same boat. So that's really helpful. That's a great starting place. Um, I was at one of my favorite uh, trauma surgeons at the hospital where I work. Uh, loves to teach residents, and residents loves to learn from him. And I always hear him in the ICU when he's around one patient. And, and he'll tell him, he's straight up, you know, one of the smartest guys that I know. But he says, we do three things here in the ICU. We do source management, we do resuscitation, and we do metabolic maintenance. That's it. That's all we do in the ICU. And, um, you know, I want him to be my doctor if I'm in a trauma and I'm in the ICU. I need to, someone to find the source of the infection. I need someone to resuscitate me if I decide that I can't breathe. And I would like for someone to maintain my metabolic status um, in a way that gives me a fighting chance for making it to the other side. So I'm very grateful for that and spent a lot of my career doing that kind of thing. But I'm gonna give you a story that um, contains sort of the basic structures of most great stories. This is something I learned from a guy named Brian McDonald who wrote a book called uh, Invisible Ink. So almost every great story, um, you know, how, however the pieces are arranged, whether it's The Sound and the Fury or Absalom, Absalom, or you know, a book by someone besides Faulkner, <laughs> starts in one way or another with Once Upon a Time. And so now you're situated in a place, once upon a time. You know, once upon a time, there was a um, middle-aged physician who had a dog named Sophia. Here's the second part of the story. Um, and every day, so we know where we're starting. We're now going to set up a context of what normal looks like. And every day, this middle-aged physician would wake up in the morning, put the leash on, and go walk the dog, Sophia, around the park. It was one of the most joyful parts of his day. He adored his dog. Third part. Until one day, he noticed that his dog was limping. And he looked at him, couldn't find anything wrong with her, but she was limping. And this 
began to worry him because it started to get worse. And because he noticed this, fourth part of the story, and because he noticed this, he began to be very tender with the dog. He began to think about, well, what are we going to do if this gets worse and worse? The dog did get worse. And because of that, he started calling around to veterinarians in town trying to find one and was able to find one out on this island uh, miles away. But it was the only one who had a spot open. And because of that, he decided to take his dog to be evaluated. The dog was looking sicker and sicker and sicker. Until finally, he walked into the veterinarian clinic with his little doggie, carried her in, and bent over her, weeping, seeing that she was in great pain and knowing that he was going to have to allow the veterinarian to put her to sleep. And the veterinarian explained the procedure and then looked at the middle-aged physician, which was me, and said, what's your name? And I said, um, you know, I had tears coming down, holding my little dog's head. I said, Ray, Ray Barfield. And he said, you took care of my dying wife back in June. And all of a sudden, I recognized him. He had a mask on, but I recognized who he was. And he helped me through that situation. And ever since then, Ever since that day, I have reframed the way that I think about the bi-directionality of our dependence on each other. One day, he may need me to help him with his dying wife. The next day, I may need him to help me with my dying dog. But there's a richness to that description that goes beyond the cancer that we ended up diagnosing in my dog. And that includes all sorts of things, once upon a time, and every day, you know what my normal is. Until one day, something comes along and breaks it. My dog is sick. And because of that, dot, dot, dot. And because of that, dot, dot, dot. My life is changing. I'm losing my loved one. Until finally, I end up in a situation where this man, who, whose wife I had taken care of, is now taking care of me and my wife and my dog. And ever since that day, and this is how many stories end. Ever since that day, I have approached the bi-directionality of this thing in a different way. I think about patients in a different way. So that's the basic story structure that goes beyond facts. And you'll see those components in any story. When I am listening for these kinds of things, when I'm recognizing that I have a human being in front of me, there are four things that I listen for, all of which are communicated via the story. And I don't know another way to get to these things. So I'm gonna tell you what these are. I'm gonna show you some stories to illustrate them. I was taking care of, um, or about to take care of, the palliative care service. I was coming on, I was listening to the palliative care doc who was going on. And we did a sign out. And we came to a patient who was in the cardiac ICU who had Duchenne's muscular dystrophy. And my partner said, no, listen, this, this one's gonna be a little bit more complicated than usual because, um, He's 17, but he doesn't really understand how sick he is. And in two weeks, he's going to turn 18, which means legally he's going to be an adult. And his mom has told us we cannot talk to him about how sick he is. And everyone's distressed. Good luck. And so uh, I went to the cardiac ICU, and I found um, the doctor who I knew had been his cardiologist for a long time. I said, uh, 
I just heard that, that this guy, the 17 year old, is in here with Duchenne's muscular dystrophy. He's had this thing his entire life, right? So I was told that he doesn't understand how bad this is, that he's dying, that he's moving towards the end of life. And the cardiologist said, yeah, yeah, it's just amazing. Never seen anything like it. 17, about to turn 18. It's not that he doesn't have intelligence or competence, he just does not know. His mother's kept it from him. His mother's kept it from him. <laughs> so I went and found his mother. And the nurses, especially, who had to be in there all day and not talk to him about his disease were very distressed over this. They were very upset at this ethical crisis. They were very upset that we were not paying attention to the autonomy of this person who was about to become an adult. They were very upset that we might be um, um, guilty of battery, of doing things to this person without telling him what's going on and letting him have agency in how he shapes his life. So they were rightly upset. So I went to the mom and I said, hey, my name is Ray. I'm a doctor. You can call me Ray. And she said, all right. And I said, um, so I have heard, I've looked through your medical record and everything, your son, and I understand that he's quite sick. And she said, yeah, he's very sick. Um, how sick do you think he is? I don't think he's going to live much longer, to be honest. Um, breaks my heart. I said, well, I heard something else. I heard that um, you don't want us to talk to him about that, uh, even though he's 17. And she said, yeah, that's right. And you're not going to talk to him about it. Now, this is a point. This is where we're getting to point number one. Because right now, I know a part of the story. But if I don't know more of the story, I'm not gonna know how to be a doctor to this child and to his mother. I'm not gonna know how to help them in this crisis at the end of this guy's life. And so instead of making a judgment, I decided to ask for more of the story. I said, can you tell me more? Like, tell me more, help me understand more of this. And she said, you know, I'm aware that the nurses are upset. And I'm aware that people think that I'm making bad decisions but I want you to know something about my son. My son is the most joyful human being you have ever met in your life. And even though he has missed out on girlfriends and missed out on college and missed out on marriage and missed out on sports, he somehow finds a way to be joyful in a way that inspires me. Now, if I walk in there and tell him that he is at the end of life, that he is dying, he's still going to die. But he's going to spend the next couple of weeks terrified. He's going to spend the next couple of weeks thinking about nothing but the fact that he's going to die. And he's going to do that instead of spending the next couple of weeks just being joyful, even though he is oblivious of what's going on. And so I have to make a choice. I have to make a choice between him having two weeks of terror or two weeks of joy. And I've decided as my last act as a parent that I want him to have two weeks of joy before he dies. And I was like, it sounds like you love your son. And she said, you have no idea. So that's the lesson. Begin with the assumption that people are acting out of love. And if instead it looks like they're just marching over the top of someone's autonomy or some other formula that we use to categorize people, listen to more of the story. Because I guarantee you that most of the time, at some point, you'll see that they are doing the best that they can to act out of love for this person who is their person. And so I said, that's amazing. I am filled with admiration at your love for him and at your ability to tell me about this in the middle of this sad crisis, and I'm so sorry that he is so sick. Is it okay with you 
if I share one little worry that I have. So I ask permission to add to the story, because this is her story, his story, not mine. Is it all right if I tell you one little worry that I have? She said, absolutely. And I said, here's my worry. Is that I'm an oncologist, and there have been many times when I have had kids as young as six whose parents were protecting them from news that their cancer was progressing and that they were going to die. And those same little kids would pull the nurse aside or pull me aside and say, listen, I'm dying, but my parents don't know. And they're going to be very upset. <laughs> and I don't want them to be upset. And if I don't talk to that little kid about dying, then that means that they are alone with their fear. Not only do they know that they're dying, but they are alone with their fear. What I worry about is that if he does know and he's protecting you the same way that you're protecting him, he may feel like he can't talk about it. And so he's just got to sit there and be alone with his terror that he's dying. And that sounds scary to me. And she was like, oh, my God, yes, that sounds horrible. I don't want that. And so I said, how about this? Um, would you give me permission to talk with him? And I promise you that I will be gentle and that I will not lead him along, I will just probe to see whether or not maybe he knows more than we think. Now, I won't lie to him. So you gotta understand, if he asks me something straight up, I'm not gonna lie to him. But I will be very gentle. I will probe very gently. And if he doesn't know anything, like you say, I will walk out of the room and we'll call it a day. And she said, all right, you can do that. So I went in, he's there, he's playing his little video game, you know. I come in and say, hey, he says, hey, he says, my name is Ray, I'm one of the doctors here, you know, hey, Ray, and um, I tell him, I just had a conversation with your mom, hmm. uh, she really loves you, oh, uh, yeah, she, she loves me, um, does she ever worry about anything, oh, yeah. <laughs> what does she worry about? I said, she worries because I'm dying. And I asked him, if she wanted to talk to you about that, would you be okay with that? And he thought for a long time. Yeah. If she wanted to talk about it, yeah. I would talk about it. Is it okay if I tell her that? Sure, Ray. So, okay, I'll leave you to your game. Thanks, Ray. <laughs> and I walked up. And I went back and I told her. And I said, here's the conversation we had. It lasted about two minutes. And um, he said that you're welcome to come in and he would be open to talking to about this because he thinks about it all the time. So she went in there and she closed the curtains, right? Two hours later, she came out and she said he has one wish. He wants to be home and play video games in his bed. Is there any way that we can do that? And so we just set up for him to have his drips, his, his pressers at home. Um, and I had a long conversation with hospice, and I said, if they ever get to a place, you know, we can keep these drips going, he can die in bed, but if they ever get to a place where they don't want to be on the drips, where they feel like they've accomplished what they need, you call me and we'll talk it through. And sure enough, two days later, the hospice nurse called me and said, they don't want to go direct to the, um, you know, we're ready to die kind of statement, but they just asked a question, is it possible that we could have some time off this pole? They know exactly what these drugs are doing. And I said, yes, of course. Um, and so we weaned him off the medications, and about 12 hours later, he died peacefully in his bed, right where he wanted to be. His mother came back and talked with us and said, thank you. Said, you gave me a chance to give him the only thing that he wanted, which was to be at home at the end of his life. And I wouldn't have known about it 
if we hadn't talked through this part of his story. So it doesn't have to be something complex. It doesn't have to be some deep, profound review of an entire life. It can be something as simple as, number one, this mother is acting out of love, not out of stupidity, not out of denial, not out of abrasive refusal to acknowledge the autonomy of her 17-year-old son. She's acting out of love. That's the piece of the story that is absolutely crucial. And the second thing is that he's also acting out of love and protecting his mother. But by continuing to explore the larger story, we may be able to get to a place where they can discover something that they would not have discovered otherwise that becomes a game changer for them in their lives. Now, I've got, um, I've got a couple of other things that I, wanna, um, that I wanna tell you about. So that first one is love. Uh, listen for love. The second one is listen for their worldview. And so I was asked to come to the ICU to see this young man who had had a bone marrow transplant. I do bone marrow transplants. I had not transplanted him. And um, I, know, I knew why I'd been asked to come. The reason is because he was on a ventilator, he was on CVVHD, which is continuous dialysis, he was on two pressors, and his bilirubin was going out the roof. So he had renal failure, pulmonary failure, cardiac failure, and liver failure. So if you have four organs failing, you will die. And they wanted me to come and get a DNR because when they talked about resuscitation status, the father had said, I don't care if you break every rib in his chest, I want you doing CPR at the end of his life. And so I walked in, never met him before. Um, once again, nurses are an amazing resource for understanding distress because they're in the room all day, 12 hours a day, they're in there. And so they pick it up like a radar. That's, ex that's who I go to to see what they're, you know, gauge their mood. So they were very distressed about the idea of doing chest compressions on this osteopenic teenager, you know, and crushing all the ribs in his chest when they knew he was absolutely gonna die. And this would be nothing but harm without benefit. So they didn't wanna do it. But the way things are set up, we get real squirrely about DNRs. It's different than any other procedure that we have. You know, no one's squirrely about ECMO. We don't just put it on, we just say, no, we're not going to. So I went in and um, there's, a, uh, there's a chant going on. I think it sounds like a chant to me. Um, and it's in another language. And so I say, hey, um, I'm one of the doctors. My name is Ray, call me Ray. And um, I listened for a while, he didn't really acknowledge I said, that's beautiful music. He said, it's not music. Um, so that you know, wasn't a great icebreaker. Um, so I said, well, what is it? And he said, it's the Quran. Um, and I asked him, well, so what, what part of the Quran? And I didn't know where to go with questions. So I just kept asking, what part of the Quran? And he listened for a minute and he said, um, he says, the part where we hear that in this life, there are things that we want, sometimes desperately so. And we ask God. And sometimes God says yes. And sometimes God says no. But whether God says yes or no, praise be to Allah. Now, there's a starting point. Because up until now, there's only been one way forward for him. Because he felt compelled to do CPR in his son, it turns out. Because he wanted to give God every chance to do a miracle. This is something we see very commonly in different faiths. I see it all the time in, in the South, in Savannah. Um, and so he did not want to communicate to God by saying, do not resuscitate that he had given up. Because if he says, don't resuscitate, he might be saying, I do not think you can do a miracle at the point of ultimate crisis. And so I'm just gonna give up on you, God. And at that point, what happens? If the child dies, and it's because he didn't show God that he had continued to have faith, it's on him. 
he walks out carrying the burden of not having shown faith to the uttermost, right? Which may be exactly the thing that God is demanding. So I started asking him questions. I didn't know what to say, and I don't know very much about Islam. Uh, so all I could do was ask questions. I said, well, tell me something about doctors. You know, what, what does the Quran say about doctors? And he talked to me about doctors. And I said, what about um, parenting? What does the Quran say about parenting? And, um, and he said, well, he said, you know, we're given this responsibility um, for these children who come in, and they're still ultimately in the hands of God. But there are two things we do for them. I learned this lesson from him, and I've used it 10,000 times. He said, we give them good things, and we protect them from harm. We give them good things, and we protect them from harm. And as he began to talk about that, we give them good things, and we protect them from harm. And he started looking around. Like he's a very smart guy. He started looking around at all the things that were going on. And I could just see his face change as he talked about what it looked like to be a responsible Muslim parent. That one way to honor God is to protect this child who God has given to you as a gift, to protect this child from harm without benefit. That is a loving thing to do, to stand between your child and the bear that's coming, to stand between your child and the bus that's coming, to stand between your child and chest compressions that are going to break every rib in his body and make the last 10 minutes of his life misery. When it's not going to do anything medically, and the experts have already said this will not change anything. I said, I didn't ask him about the Dion. I said, thank you so much for teaching me so much about Islam. You're welcome. And I walked out. Ten minutes later, I got paged. And the text was, what did you say? He walked out and told us to make his son DNR. Well, for me, exploring this man's worldview, where he was coming from, was absolutely critical to be any sort of guide, even though I only guided through questions, not through direction for him to come to a place where he could see that he did not have to heartbreakingly make a decision to have his child damaged um, instead of allowing a peaceful death, which is what he wanted to do. And he didn't have to make a choice between that and disobeying God. He was able to honor God and honor the gift of being a parent by protecting his son from something that the experts had said, this will not help, this will only harm. And so he was able to act as a faithful father and a faithful Muslim which I thought was quite beautiful. So that's the second thing. Listen for what their worldview is. Um, the third thing that I think is crucial and only comes through stories is listening for the gift that a person has brought into a room. And so one of the things that's gotten worse with COVID, many things have, but one of the things is these masks. And so everyone is anonymous. But in the hospital, anonymity is just how we do things. Everyone wears the same color robe. Everyone's in the same color room. Everyone has a medical record number. And on rounds, we talk about what the EKG showed, what the sodium was, what the potassium was, what the creatinine was, what the BUN was, what the CBC showed, what the path report was. But we miss out many times on the person. You know, I can imagine with me, um, Mr. Barfield is a 57-year-old white male with, and then a litany of all the horrible things that I've done in my life. And which, of course, the conclusion is that's why I'm in the hospital. You know, so before the first sentence ends, the narrative about my life is that I've created lots of problems in my life, um, and it's my fault. So that's one way to tell a story. But there's another way, which is to listen for the gifts this person has brought into the world. And that can be quite a gift to the family. Um, so I had a, a patient, Teresa. Uh, you know, and the, the names, obviously, I change. I change the details and protect patients. But the core is what I'm trying to get to. But she, she weighed um, almost 500 pounds. And she had something called Fournier's gangrene, where she had uh, respiratory distress, was intubated, was placed on a ventilator. And over time, because of her weight, 
compromised the circulation to the skin and muscle on her back, and that skin began to die. And so she had to be taken repeatedly to the operating room and have it removed, but every time she came back and was repositioned, her weight, which would passively just lay on that part of the skin, would make a new part of the skin die. Uh, Corneus ganglia. Well, after several weeks of this, and multiple trips um, to the operating room, uh, we called in her family. Now this is COVID, so you're only allowed one visitor, but we had a little loophole where we could do a goals of care conversation. And all that I knew about this patient, because she couldn't speak to me, she was awake, but she couldn't speak to me. She had a tracheostomy, and she wasn't strong enough for us to put a cap on and allow her to speak. And so all I knew is, you know, Teresa, 50-something-year-old um, African-American woman who weighs X, who has Fournier's gangrene because of this, just these facts about it. But when her family came in, um, the first person I met was her oldest son. And he came in, and he had slippers on. Um, his feet were swollen, and so I knew that was why he was wearing his bedroom slippers. And he came in, and we walked down the hall, and he, he shuffled down the hall as we went in and began telling stories about his mom. By the time we got up there, all the other people had gotten out of the car, and, and the chaplain had brought him up. And so, you know, we had six people, six children that she had birthed. And at first, they were very angry. Um, they looked at her skin. Her skin was very dry and flaky. And they said, why, why is no one taking care of her? You know, why isn't she bathed better? Why is there no, no ointment on her skin? Why aren't you caring for her? Um, this was a very important point to me. And they tried desperately, you know, to reach toward their mother. They began to um, film me, you know, uh, everything that I would say. I was like, you know, please, please do. You know, I want you to be able to remember this um, in case you need to go back and listen to the conversation. So I was fine with that. A lot of people don't like that. And over time, after they told us their concerns that their mother was not being well cared for, and we got to the place where we simply gathered around her and looked at her and the eldest son, she wouldn't answer me. I would ask questions. There was no answer. But the eldest son said, Mama, we're all here. And she looked around. And each one of these kids had been inside her, you know, and had come into the world through her. Now she's not just um, a, a large patient with Fournier's gangrene who needs multiple trips to the OR and who's got rotting skin and who smells bad because of the rot and the sort of thing. No. She is the mother of these six people who are gathered around her and who clearly adore her and who are terribly upset because since they haven't been able to visit her with COVID, they had no idea how sick she was. And her eldest son said, Mama, are you okay? And she said, Mama, is there something you want? Mama, do you want to stay here? Mama, do you want to come home? And so he looked at me and he said, Doc, you got to, you know, tell her what that means. And so I said, Miss Teresa, you know, that if you go home, we, we can get you there. But when you get there, we'll take you off the ventilator. It will mean that that's the end of your life. You'll die at home. She said, you know, I said, do you understand? Mm -hmm. Is that what you want to do? And she, I could tell she was going, hmm. 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 How do you say yes? You know, yes, I want to go home and die. Okay, how do you say yes? But there came a place where she found it inside herself, and she nodded. All her kids started to cry. But we were able to get her home, and she died that night when we took her off the ventilator. But she died at home, surrounded by people that she loved. But what a beautiful gift that she had brought these lovely people into the world. And that instead of being a sort of biological specimen on the bed, she was able to die with the dignity of being the mother to these six beautiful children. Um, 
I was honored to have taken care of him. There's a second guy um, whose name was Henry. And Henry was in his 70s when I met him in the hospital. But he was had a lot of difficulty with, um, with complex speech. I called up his sister and, and talked with her. He also had some gangrene. His foot was dying of diabetes. He had a whole lot of problems. Um, but I called up his sister and I said, can you tell me more about him? Because he is not able to have an in-depth conversation with me and I don't know where to go with decisions for him. And she said, oh yeah, yeah. She said, let me tell you something about him. Um, when he was a toddler, um, his uncle left gasoline in the water pail. And he went to the water pail and drank it. And he didn't walk again until he was six years old after that. And ever since then, he's had a little bit of trouble. But he's the sweetest man that you'll ever meet. And so there we are. First of all, I know he's sweet. I know that he's come up against some hard things. She said, you know, he never got married. I think he could have been married, but he never got married. But, oh, that man was sweet, and he would do anything for you. And my heart started to melt for this man because he's no longer just an elderly gentleman in a gown. You know, it's this kid who, this man who, as a kid, drank gasoline and had his entire life changed. And yet, despite that, he has a generosity of heart that is, his sister describes as, as beautiful. She went on to say, he kept every card anyone ever sent him, and regularly he goes through them and rereads them. And I thought, that is so sweet. Just the idea that he would value these cards so much, and instead of doing what I do, which is, oh, hey, that's really great, and tossing it, which I know means none of you will ever send me a card, <laughs> and I hope my mother's not watching this. Instead of that, he cared deeply about it. She said, he has the combination lock from high school, and he remembers the combination. So let me tell you something about him. Um, nothing ever gets old. Everything is always new and beautiful to him, including people. And every little gesture of kindness, like those cards, and every little thing that reminds him of a part of his life, like that combination lock. And I thought, wow, that's a gift. To value that so much in a throwaway world where containers are expendable, water bottles are expendable. You know, we haven't even paid off our car before we buy a new car because it's the newest model around. We discard things all the time. We discard people all the time. And in the middle of it, this guy? demonstrated this gorgeous valuing of things, recovery of things, retention of memories in this gentle way. I thought that was very beautiful. Um, so the first thing that we talked about that I think is really important that comes through these kinds of stories, assume love. The second, listen for the patient's world. The third, listen for the gifts they bring into the world so that they aren't just anonymous people with medical record numbers and gowns in a bland beige room who have labs abstracted uh, from the rest of their life. The last thing is this. Um, listen for what the patient actually needs. I had this wonderful 20-something-year-old um, guy who had metastatic um, cancer. He had a sarcoma and it had metastasized to his lungs. He had been all over the country and had gone to Europe as well looking for cures because his parents were very well off. And he was uh, back with me. He wasn't actually my patient. Uh, I had taken care of him a few times, but he was back in my institution. And um, his dad uh, asked him, he said, would you get Ray to come here? Not you know, as an oncologist, I want him to come and just talk with me. Uh, and so I agreed to. And I didn't know what I was going to walk into. I hadn't seen this guy for months. So I walked in the room, and there he is. I always loved this guy from the beginning. He was an actor, and he was so beautiful, his mind, and his gentleness. And he was sitting in bed, and it was dark, and the blinds were closed. And he's sitting there. And I don't 
don't say anything because I don't want him to have to say anything to me. And so I just sit down. <laughs> and I sit there for a long time, 10 minutes, 15 minutes. And I just sit there in silence. And um, I'm very moved by how debilitated he is, you know. He's a vibrant 20-something-year-old guy. I mean, he should be like everyone in this room except us. <laughs> um, <laughs> sorry, Steve. <laughs> and so I say, hey, is it okay if I ask you a question? And he nods. And I say, what do you need? So I need this little piece of the story. And he says, um, he says, I can't, and he pauses, take very deep breaths. I need to take a deep breath so that I I can cry one time, I will be okay. And I, you know, so I pick myself up off the floor and I'm like, I'm going to try to help make that happen. So I called the nurse, I called the respiratory therapist, and everyone in there, and I gave him epinephrine and I gave him albuterol nebulizer and I upped his oxygen to 100 and I gave him a benzodiazepine for anxiety and I gave him morphine for dyspnea. I had a fan blowing on his face and I did everything I could. He was able to cry one time. And after he finished, he closed his eyes and the next day he died. But that little piece, you know, took a mini story, you know, a mini story. What do you need? There's nothing on these monitors that's telling me what you need. Only you can tell me the story of what it's like to be you on the inside and what you need. I need to cry one. So that's the thing that I want to point to. Whether we're talking about understanding a religious worldview or a philosophical worldview or the inside of what it is to be afraid the inside of what it is to feel yourself losing the story you thought you were going to have. Um, the inside of wanting your family, wanting to be able to get to a place where the team can see the dignity that you have. You know, like Henry, who never let go of a card because he valued it and he reread them, which is so adorable, you know? Or Teresa, who had all these children how we can understand the humanity of people so that we can be present to them, which is a profoundly healing act. And so that's what I would encourage you. And I will tell you, I know of nothing more important than I can think of, especially in a campus like this, where you're developing these powerful and robust programs in physical therapy and in the physician assistant school and all these sorts of things. I can think of nothing that would be more valuable than creating partnerships since you have access to it between those schools and the religious studies department, you know? Bridges to philosophy, where you're thinking about the moral dimension, where you're thinking about the religious dimensions. Even if you're not religious, your patients are. It's their story. Um, these kinds of bridges can really give us tools. It certainly helped me to be present to patients in a way that the mechanistic approach, even though it's very useful for certain kinds of things, simply cannot do. We're not treating machines. We're treating people. And that's where, even though I think medicine is utterly dysfunctional as an institution, my new question is, is it possible to flourish in a dysfunctional institution? And the answer is yes. And the way that I do it is this, you know, I want to be competent in all of my medical things. When I do it, when I write something, I make sure the decimal point's in the right place, right? People trust me to be competent. But there's a lot more to these healing arts than that. And so no matter how much dysfunction there is in the institution, when I walk into the room and I close that door, that space is no longer corporate. It's no longer institutional. This space is sacred. 
And inside that space, I am very interested in who has shown up. And I myself am showing up as a human being, not as an automaton, not as a technology or a pill dispenser. I'm showing up as an agent, a moral agent, somebody who loves, who hurts, who's failed, who does all these things. I can hear a story, and I can let that story guide me in understanding how to be a better healer for you. And so that's the thing that, that I would encourage y'all as a community to really think about as you develop richer and richer programs. Think about partnerships, because you are not treating machines, you're treating people. And that is, that is a sacred calling. Um, good, so I'll stop there, thank you. Well, so um, I, I would talk with the parents. You know, it depends on the age of the child, depends on their maturity. You know, um, if a 16-year-old tells me something, uh, I'm going to be. I mean, this is a person who has adult-like agency, even though a lot of their independence has been stripped from them because of, you know, cancer, and they, you know, they're supposed to be off rebelling, and instead, you know, they're in the bed. So it depends on the age of the kid. With a six-year-old, you know, I'm going to talk with their parents. They're six. Um, but I'm, I've got a way of talking with them, though. And um, I learned it through several ways. My most common mode of discovery and exploration and honing my skills is failing. So I just keep making mistakes over and over again and do everything I can to try to learn from them when I mess up. Um, but the other thing in this was um, a book by a woman anthropologist named Myra Bluebon Langer called The Private Worlds of Dying Children. And she's, she's an anthropologist who spent a year on a pediatric oncology ward to try to understand more about the dynamics of that ward. And I think, you know, that's a really great way to do it because all of the kids know who everybody is. All the kids know that the intern can't make decisions by herself. She needs to get permission from the upper level resident. But the upper level resident comes in, you better watch out, because you might get a shot. Um, everyone understands the hierarchy. And so the kids understood, she's an anthropologist, so she can't do anything uh, in that medical chart. She cannot give me something that's gonna hurt. And so she was invited into the room uh, by these kids. And the kids would literally like let her just watch TV with them for an hour. And she'd sit there and she'd watch Peppa Pig or whatever they watch for an hour which is, uh, she should be commended for. Um, <laughs> and one of the things she talks about in The Private Worlds of Dying Children is that, um, so she was, she was I felt um, uh, a deep sense of relief when I read her book because she described these kinds of things that we had experienced as well. But she helped me understand a couple of things. One, though, you know, I'm always, you know, about, well, let's just have, you know, open communication. We're going to have open communication, and that's going to just... But if your family has, if its mode of crisis management is silence, one of the things that she found is that you need to really pay attention to this conspiracy of silence, because it may be playing a certain role. And, you know, this is something for you all to think about, because there's nothing written, this is not handed down from God. It's handed down from Myra Blue Von Langer, who's close, but not quite. <laughs> and she said, you can't, if a family's mode of coping, if the way the parents show up to an impossibly sad situation is to simply deny what's happening, at least they're showing up. And if you insist that the family grieve and deal with truth the way that you would in your family, if you insist on that, you can break them and you can literally end up with parents not showing up at the kid's room because it is simply overwhelming. I've had that happen twice in my career, but when you watch it, it is distressing beyond words. And so uh, I would recommend that book 
as a way of you know the private worlds of dying children because the entire book focuses on on your question and it's one that I'm still on this key part of the learning curve for even after you know 20 years of doing this. Um, let's see, which books have you written? I mean, <laughs> I'm trying to gain favors here. Um, yeah, there's, uh, I would recommend um, Thich Nhat Hanh, How to Fight. It's a very short book. And the other title that could have had is How to Love. Um, when you're in a crisis situation, you know, you walk into the room and they're in the middle of their worst crisis, and they are sleep deprived, and they have been eating hospital food, and they're under COVID restrictions, and so they can't even get relief forces to come in, they're just stuck there. They're watching their loved one die. Um, maybe they feel like they haven't been listened to. And they come in, and you come in in the morning, you're just trying to do your job. And all of a sudden, before you know it, this person is all over you. Thich um, Nhat Hanh, How to Fight. Uh, it, will, it will show you things about how to be compassionate towards yourself. It will show you things about how to see past the surface, even of an actual enemy, even of someone who has hurt you horribly. And I think internalizing these kinds of lessons about gentleness can do a world of good when we're in the middle of sort of continual crisis uh, and we're in and out of crisis. So we're in crisis with patients and families and then we're out of crisis and we're trying to do reentry as we go home and try to cook Brussels sprouts, right? And there's like this contrast between cooking Brussels sprouts, you know, and being in the crisis room, right? And then your person comes home and like, what's that smell? That's Brussels sprouts. I'm cooking Brussels sprouts. You know, like, you know I don't like Brussels sprouts. It's like, look, all day long I was with dying people and I'm cooking Brussels sprouts. So yeah, I mean, that's one way you can approach it. It's how I approach it um, on my bad days. But Thich Nhat Hanh will show you a lot of things about how to walk into a room with strangers who, you, who need you but who don't want to be in this situation. And then also how to do re-entry with your loved people. Um, it's a remarkable book. Most of the books that I think about um, are books that have to do with maintaining your relationships with people who are important for your own life and regeneration, um, but who don't have an insight into what you're doing in the hospital. And so communication can get wider and wider apart and your relationship can get weaker and weaker over time and you start relying on people who are in your workplace and all sorts of things become very difficult. You know? So thinking about that ahead of time. There's a, a book called Difficult Conversations that was uh, written by the um, Harvard group that did a whole series of studies on um, like uh, crisis, you know, like negotiation conversations and things like that. So difficult conversations. I can't remember the three authors' names, but just go on there and you'll see it. It's, it's a, a really wonderful book. There's lots of them. Um, there, there are books about, um, you know, um, there's a book on intuition, on medical intuition. And that's something that, you know, you frequently, we, we, we try to extrapolate from abstracted data. We try to be scientific in our thinking. We try to use, you know, logical application of scientific principles and data. But the problem with that is that you know, if you have a Petri dish, you can control the conditions for every Petri dish so that all of them have the same pH and the same number of cells inoculated and everything like that. But in this room, if you think about the variables, like, there's no way we're controlling variables from person to person. And so at best, medicine is like you know, approximation in a lot of cases. And in that, you, you, you learn to trust your intuition. Um, I think that's really important. Um, and then anything that can lead you to a meditation practice, which I did not do for a very long time, um, but anything that can prompt it, um, and we were actually talking about this earlier today, like you don't have to read 50 books on meditation, just read a little bit about it until you understand it and then start doing it. Um, it will make so much difference in your ability
ability to center, um, especially when things blow up in a room. I could not recommend the practice more than 30 minutes a day of meditation. And you know, you can talk. There are people here. You know, Steve and I talked about it. Steve runs a course on it. It's really worth thinking about. So, so come over to the religion department and ask. Hey, what's this meditation thing of which you spoke? <laughs> How um, how has taking the approach of truly trying to learn the story of a patient, how has that affected your grieving at the loss of a patient and, and at the in a physician to patient level? Yeah. Man, I mean, I went through a really dysfunctional grieving process um, where I was just accumulating grief and not doing anything with it. And I didn't have anyone that I knew of that I could talk to because um, within the medical arena, the, this, some of these kinds of feelings and so forth, um, you know, you're supposed to buck up and, and you know, keep moving on, you know, like a good little soldier. And uh, I needed a therapist. I should have gotten a therapist the day I started medical school. Um, you know, not because there's anything wrong with me, but because if you don't have someone to process things with, uh, they will accumulate it. And you will have to make some adjustments in order to keep doing this day in and day out. And some of the adjustments can be really unhealthy. Um, and, and, you know, it was something that I had to really work through because it was disrupting, you know, my own family relationships. And um, it, was, it was just too much grief. And what I suddenly realized is that, um, is that I, I, I was not satisfied with the language of professionalism, you know? And it's fine, it's fine as a placeholder, it's fine as a start, but it's too thin a gruel for the level of loss and horror that we ultimately end up encountering. Um, it didn't go far enough, at least for me. And um, the metaphors of boundaries, and you know, keep your distance and make sure you maintain your boundaries. Those all felt like walls that would get in the way of something really important to me, which is knowing the person in front of me. And I, I eventually learned with help from my wife and help from my therapist and just people who had insight, that the question, the, the thing that helped me to understand was love. And so, I began to realize like there is a love that I have for my wife that is fitting for my relationship with my wife. And there is a love that I have with my children that's different, that's fitting for my relationship with my children. And there's a love for my friends, likewise, that's different and fitting for that relationship. And um, it's not that it's everything's clean and neat by any means, because we're humans, everything's messy. But um, I began to explore the idea of what it looks like, what a love fitting for the relationship of the medical, you know, of the clinician and the patient. What does that love look like? And that, that helped a lot, you know? Um, that plus to all the, 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 the PA students, you know, I already like talked way too much earlier today, but to reemphasize the point, you know, I needed also to come to terms with my own mortality. I needed to release ego and understand that I am not alone, I'm not isolated, I'm a part of a team, I bring one thing, but I don't bring everything. We're doing this together. Um, so, so that plus understanding what love is in the context of a clinician and a patient really became a rich sort of way that I could move forward. And, um, and so I don't have the same kinds of crises that I used to have where every, every loss was like my own kid dying. It's not my child, but I love them anyway. I'd figure that out. Yeah. All right, well, thank you all very much.